The Mark Thompson Show. It is with a great anticipation that I welcome this guy. I'm a huge fan of his work. I loved him when he was a contestant. I loved him when he was a host, as one of the fill-in hosts, when they were looking for someone to take over for Alex Trebek. They brought in many of those accomplished Tournament of Champions winners and those who knew Jeopardy really well, and also celebrities. It was quite the rotation. But I thought this guy really distinguished himself. I, I was kind of on Team Buzzy, and I'm someone who's followed him then since, and I've seen him on other shows, and he's just... He's got it all, you know, brains, smarts, and he's still humbled, got a great sort of way about him. I, I'm so impressed by his work ethic as well. I won't delay any longer. I'm just trying to make a point. How about it for Buzzy Cohen, everyone? Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. I got to live up to that uh, introduction. Well, I will tell you, you already have because the latest podcast, oh. which is out of the Jeopardy world, I listened to last night. And it's terrific. But I mean terrific. Um, you really walk listeners through the origins of Jeopardy. And I, there's some special treasures in all of that. Yeah. So tell, tell everybody about this and tell me about this, this podcast that has yeah. just launched. I think yesterday was the day it launched. Yeah, I, yeah. Came out yesterday. Um, the response has been already so awesome, including from you. That means so much coming from you. I know you know you're you know so much about broadcasting and and uh, hosting and all that stuff. So really, I, I take your praise very, very to heart. Um, so this podcast came about because one thing that we learned in the last couple of years is how important Jeopardy is to people, to American culture. I mean, this thing. I think, you know, the, the host replacement thing felt like a Supreme Court, uh, you know, <laughs> replacement, you know, like a, a confirmation hearing. Um, and so it's like, why, how did it, how did like a syndicated game show become this thing that is so important to people that we care so much about? That's headline news. That's, you know, in the New York Times and all this stuff. And so with that in mind, we're like, well, let's go back and see where this came from and how the show transformed through various moments and really what is going on behind the show. So there's kind of a multifaceted thing, but it's really like an examination of the how we got to where Jeopardy is today, what Jeopardy is today, because there's another podcast that I'm on, Inside Jeopardy, which is really about like what's going on right now in the show, what's coming up, and this is more of an investigation look back. Um, well... The yeah, I was just going to say, while, while we're talking to you, I was just going to ask our, our live audience, and a lot of people take in the show on delay or whatever, you know, throughout the day, but uh, those who are in the chat now, if you have any questions, you made me think of it actually just now, Buzzy, when you said that you talk about the the inside uh, Jeopardy stuff that you uh, have on the existing podcast, I mean, the one that is the one you've been doing for a while. Yeah. If anybody's got questions, now's the time. So if you've got a Jeopardy question while we've got Buzzy on, we'll yeah. slip it in, but you got to get it in now. Anyway, please continue. I'm sorry. So you were doing no, no, no. that podcast you were saying, yeah. Exactly. So, so um, the... This is Jeopardy really takes you like the first episode is where did this show come from? And it's an incredible story. I mean, it it, it brings in everything like Marlon Brando comes in. Uh, <laughs> you know, we talk about Art Fleming. We, Merv Griffin is obviously at the center of it. Uh, Merv's wife, uh, the quish, you know, Mark Van Doren, Charles Van Doren. I mean, like the people that walk through and even moving up into the, you know, Alex Trebek era as we get into that, Lucille Ball. Weird Al Yankovic. I mean, the, the the random people that kind of walk through the Jeopardy story is incredible. You know, I, I in preparing to make this, I actually listened to another podcast about uh, um, the creation and the kind of story of the Oprah Winfrey show. And that's like another show where Oprah got syndicated initially because she had the same syndicator as Jeopardy and Wheel. And those shows were such a success in syndication that King World then had the leverage to push Oprah into um, the American audience. That's exactly right. They said, if you want Jeopardy and Wheel, then run this show, which is called Oprah. That's exactly how it happened. That's how syndication works so often. The other thing, and I'm not going to reveal, I want people to go to the podcast to hear it. But the other uh, juicy fact is how it got the name Jeopardy. That yes. wasn't the original name from Merv. It wasn't the original, you know, as Merv was kind of putting it together, that wasn't the original name. But how they came up with it 
And I love that you actually had clips from Merv himself yeah. in the podcast. Yeah, one of the great things, obviously, you know, some people who have passed, there's archival clips, but a lot of people who have been involved in making the show, first of all, are still making the show. You know, there are people who have been on, you know, Jeopardy is entering its 40th year. There are people who have been on the show for 38 years who are still working on the show. Wow. And so, um, we were able to interview a lot of these people who, you know, were there, you know, we, we have a whole episode about Ken's run and we have like the EP and the producers who were sitting there in the booth going, oh my God, did we just kill this show? Did we, like, you know what I mean? Like sure. at the, now looking back on it, of course, this like lifting the game limit was the greatest thing the show did in the last, you know, 40 years really. But at the time, it was like, oh shit, what's gonna happen? Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. On <laughs> I think you're allowed. It's okay. We're allowed. Okay. We, we avoid like, it, but it's oh, okay. No, what what did we do? And just kind of like getting to hear the people talk about what it was like to live through those moments. And we go through all that. We even like there are a couple different episodes where we follow a day of taping, but there's one episode where we we do that day from the contestant point of view. There's one episode where we do it following Ken. He was the host at that time. Oh, that's great. And we have one where we go through the writers and like writing a show and then the writers and researchers are watching along. And if there's a contested answer, you know, they, they, you know, go and they caucus. Yeah. yeah and decide if they can accept it off site. There's like a, there's like a separate, you know, room where they're all with, it's actually a library that they have where they start researching. Oh, should we accept that? Um, and so, so there, oh, there really is a board of governors kind of the jeopardy. Yes. I love that. It's yes. the writers and producers. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, uh, I want to I want to ask you a meta question, and yes. you kind of touched on it and made me think of it. And you and you do uh, get into this, and again, I'm just uh, you've only dropped one episode so far of the This Is Jeopardy podcast, but I was just transfixed as I listened. I just loved it. Uh, and, and by the way, it also like when you're listening and taking in certain media, it has a lot of here. Uh, Tony's got it up on the screen now; you can see it. Um, this is Jeopardy, the story of America's favorite quiz show. It was late last night. I wanted to make sure I listened to the show before I had you on, you know, and I was excited about listening. I'm a Jeopardy fan anyway and a fan of your work, obviously, as I said. So I listened to it. And when it's late at night and there's no other distraction or whatever, that you really get into a story. And the story of Jeopardy is a great story. And so, as I say, there are all of these nuggets. But as I was listening, I wanted to ask you this question, which now I'm going to ask you. Do you think that uh, it's best for a show when a, I know my answer to this, I'm curious about you, when a contestant rocks it day after day after day, episode after episode. So you see, as we've seen in the case of Jeopardy recently, the sort of super dominant yeah. contestant where you're almost not even within a uh, catch-up range by the time Final Jeopardy rolls around. Is that good for a show, or do you think it? Uh, you don't want someone that strong? I think it makes better television. I think it's more exciting. I think um, the stakes suddenly get higher, right? The stakes feel more important. You know, right now on the show, which is much more normal to have a spate of one- or two-day champs, um, it's still a great show. I mean, I think the thing that is really should like we learned through all of the turmoil you know in season 38 or whatever is how rock solid the format is because even if you liked some of the guest hosts better than others it was still jeopardy and i think they're like the majority of people tune in for great writing um a really tight format it's it's pretty bulletproof you know you can make little tweaks here and there but it's a pretty bulletproof format I think what a, a long running champ does is bring other people in because it feels like there's something special happening. And I that, know so, I've met so many people who are like, oh my God, when Matt Amodio, when, when Amy Schneider or James Holtower were on their run, I started watching and I totally got hooked. And that's how I started watching Jeopardy. Th that, by the way, is the right answer. It only helps the show. Exactly. I want to uh, answer a couple of questions because there's some good questions. And I want to say that we get into these. Um, yeah, go ahead. So somebody asked about buzzing in. How do the buzzers work? Oh, and that's right. Yeah. Entire episode of the podcast about how the buzzer works. So I want to tell people you there is an episode coming. It is very well written and researched. We do half of it is from the contestant point of view. And there's a guy named Fritz Holtznagel who has created a buzzer practice system. He wrote a book about secrets of the buzzer, how to get he runs like 
boot camp, buzzer boot camps. But then we also interview Michael Harris, who works for the show, and he's the guy who enables the buzzer. And you are exactly right, uh, Chad. The contestants have to wait until the host finishes the question to buzz in. But that was not the case in season one of the show. In season one, they could buzz in whenever. But Alex was a host and a producer because they didn't have enough money in the host uh, budget to pay him what he wanted. So he said, I'll be a producer too, so I can make more money. And as a producer, he said, it doesn't work to have people buzzing in whenever. Let's change it so they have to wait till I'm finished. And that fundamentally changed the game and also has made it such a great watch along experience because you don't have all this chaos of people buzzing in. Us watching at home get to hear the entire clue. Yeah, that's right. In the early days of Jeopardy, uh, which you also chronicle so well in the first episode, they would you'd hear immediately the when when the clue was revealed, you'd hear immediately the bing, like somebody's like, "Dude, we haven't even seen the question yet," and that was the whole thing. You've had to beat the other person to the reveal almost. Yeah. Uh, so it was a blind buzz in almost. Right. When you're when you're there just to follow up on Chad's question, do you? Uh, do you get a sense of the question before you buzz in? You almost ha it would because you Alex yeah. is reading it or Ken's reading it. Most I think most contestants agree that you read the clue faster than the host does sure. and figure out if you know it. And then there is a difference of opinion if you either listen, do by ear, the, the host finishing, or what you can't see at home is that there are actually lights along the side of the board. And when the buzzer is enabled, the lights turn on. So some people go by the lights and some people go by ear. The other question was, did Alex speak with you in the commercial break? Alex would speak mostly with the audience during the commercial break. And that was something that he actually created. Somebody mentioned that Art Fleming was the original host. We have an episode about Alex becoming the host and he was very controversial. A lot of people were not happy about Alex Trebek hosting Jeopardy. And um, talking to the audience was one of the things he initiated in that uh, initial period during the commercial breaks, and he continued to do that. And now um, Ken and Mayim both do that as well, taking questions from the audience. Um, one reason that the host does not talk to contestants uh, much during the game is that they've been looking at all of the game material. You get all you get all the five games that are taped that day plus a bonus game that gets thrown out. That's a part of a standards and practices thing. Um, and, uh, oh, stop right there. You're, you're saying the host reviews a, a bonus game that gets thrown out also you're saying, right. okay, go right. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that the, the writers and the host review six games and then a, a separate party that, that is separate from jeopardy that's standards and practices or selects and orders the five games of the day separate from production. So that's to make everything fair. But I what see. I want to say is, I may have read something about, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro that's coming up later in the game. And you might say, oh, I'm going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And I might mention something that's in that clue by accident. Now, I don't think Alex would do that. I don't think most hosts would do that. But I think just to be careful that something doesn't slip out, you're like, I don't know why I'm thinking about whatever, but it's in my head. I think, you know, Jeopardy, as you hear in the first um, episode, is really a product of the game show scandal and it is one of the shows you know that really fought to have integrity against that and not talk the separation of host and contestant was a big part of that it was wild to hear also in that first episode that merv thought it was all over like after that scandal that you're yeah. talking about merv thought oh game shows are done this is awful for us you know following yeah. that you know that van doren scandal and of course uh they did go into hibernation i guess for a while yeah and but um it's really a great story about turning the challenge into the feature, right? Oh, we got in trouble for giving the contestants answers. Right. All right, well, let's make a game show where we give them the answers. You know, it was it, it, it's so inspired and it, it, it's great. And you, that's a great part of the story. Melody says, uh, love the SNL parody of Jeopardy. Did Alex like it? Do you know the answer to yes, that question? He did. Yeah. He, he liked them. He knew them. But his favorite was the Eugene Levy impersonation, which I think was on. I think it was on SCTV, oh, maybe. SCTV, sure. Yeah. But he, that was his favorite uh, parody. You know, it's funny because I think Will Ferrell was playing a character, but I don't know if it was like a very Alex trebek -y character. It was more like a befuddled professor. If you actually watch it and listen to it, it's not very Alex. But it was sort of like, 
just kind of a foil, like the straight man for all of the other, um, you know, so-called celebrities. Yeah, um, the madness was, um, yeah, yeah. He definitely uh, knew all of it. He loved all. I mean, he knew that if you're getting that kind of parody and stuff, it means you're doing something that is really resonating with people. We're talking to Buzzy Cohen, and uh, how does Jeopardy hire writers, Debbie is asking, and have any former players become writers? I don't believe any former players have become writers. The The, the sort of um, funnel is actually most people become researchers first. And so you work as a researcher supporting the writing team. Every clue has to have at least three sources. It's very, very well sourced. So they have to, it can't just be like, oh, I read this in one place. They need to find two other sources to back it up. We have processes and protocols and standards. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, and in doing that, you really learn how a clue is crafted. And so that's kind of the, the farm team for the writing staff. Um, I see. So that if you're interested in becoming a writer, look for those researcher job openings over at Jeopardy. That's and that was also asked. Did they hire civilians? So yeah, I mean these mostly these, mostly civilians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a really odd question, but let me just throw it. In. It's really like I didn't know this. Uh, Rain is asking: Did Mel Gibson's father win Jeopardy, and his winnings financed the family's move to the U.S. Fr from the U.S. to Australia? That's a wild I've story. Never is that story, but I can. Yeah. Look it yeah. up. Can you get I your mean, best people on that? <laughs> get my best people on it. But yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that's really fun too is we have the audio and the person who won the first game ever of Jeopardy on the that. That was magnificent, Buzzy. That was and, so great. And you know, in you know the pre, you know, everyone complains about how low the winnings are now that they need to up the dollar amounts. Like people were winning like two hundred dollars back in nineteen sixty three or whatever. Yeah, it, it really is wild to see. Uh, you know, now there's real money. And I, I guess that was real money at the time. Yeah. You know, it just looks like, right, it's just as a result of, you know, inflation and everything else, uh, it, it just looks like so much less. Yeah. Um, so uh, I do recommend this. This is Jeopardy is what it's called. Yeah. And, and it's a real good um, entry-level uh, ride. I mean, it's kind of a yarn. You know, you're sort of a storyteller. Uh, and <laughs> Yeah. No, it's a different uh, it's a different muscle than like being a host or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah did, I had yeah, I go ahead. as as you know, Mark. We've talked about it. I did an audio book um, uh, that got published in twenty twenty, and sort of felt like I was working that muscle again. But yeah, it's it's a very different thing. It's really it's you know it's still engaging. And one of the things that um, I really learned when I was guest hosting that you really realize when you watch Alex versus you know other game show hosts or whatever. There are 61 clues in every game of Jeopardy and everyone he told as a little story. There was, mm -hmm. it wasn't just, I'm reading the clue. It was, I'm telling you this story. And he really like, and so I think one of the things that I really worked on was like, okay, what's the, what's the story here? What's the interesting thing? How do I make this an engaging story for each of those clues that you blow through in 30 seconds? You know, if you, if you map it out, 61 clues in a half an hour, um, and that was really his gift. And I think I appreciate you, uh, you know, the compliment because I, it was it's definitely a different muscle. But I tried to bring in some of what I learned from my uh, guest hosting. experience. Well, this is, I think, one of your superpowers, which is that you go to school on what you need to do for various yeah. situations that are all different. And sometimes they don't look as though they would be very different. But you go to school on them. I remember Buzzy Cohen talking about how he watched recordings of Trebek and Jeopardy and the different ways that Trebek said that's right or that's yeah. wrong or that all these little things that you wouldn't even necessarily focus on because you might be blinded by the bigger job of hosting Jeopardy. So when you filled in, you brought all of that. You really you know, sort of went to college yeah. on Jeopardy. And I, I give you a lot of credit for that. And I think it stood, it stood you well when you actually right. got in there. Yeah, I mean, I've said it before, but I knew I was probably the longest shot in that bunch. If you look, you know, Katie Couric and I mean, the, the LeVar yeah. Burton, the, the, the level of talent and including, you know, Ken, who spent more time on the stage than than anyone other than Alex. I, I if I wanted to be considered, I needed to be kind of undeniable. And so I was just like, all right, that's the goal. And I just did everything I could to try to get in there. So. I'm glad. Well, that, that was, and, and this is interesting. Everybody had their favorites and there you are with Alex. That's very, <laughs> very cool. Love it. Love it. 
you're also a, a character, but you know how to crank up that character and then crank down that character, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, so, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think kind of a social awareness thing that you turn, that you apply then to the setting of the show. And I've been on a few different shows and they've asked different things of me. And so I think um, a lot of people maybe are, it's harder for them to shift, right? There's like, oh, I've created this thing. And I'm, I think it's just, I remember being a contestant and it's really the contestant's moment. And so when I host, it's about kind of stepping back or possibly like teeing people up to have their moment versus, you know, on the chase or something like that, where it's a little more like I'm supposed to be the chess beating, you know, egomaniac up there at the right. top of that slide or whatever. Um, and, you know, I can do that because I can laugh at myself and so I can have fun with it. I think uh, if I really believed it, I, I don't know if I would be able to live my <laughs> live with myself. <laughs> yeah, the, on the chase, they really make you, you know, kind of play the WWE wrestler kind yeah. of role. Yeah, which is really kind yeah. of funny. Um, yeah. Is it is the chase coming back? I don't know. Okay. Um, the uh, other uh, question... Well, sorry, I, yeah. sorry, I should say, we have another, um, I think, we have another five or ten episodes that are airing. I think there are five more episodes airing in June. Yes. Mm. That we've already taped. I don't know if we're, I don't know what's happening after that. Uh, uh, several people buzzy for permanent host. I mean, that ship has sailed, but it's so cool that so many people are, uh, I wish you were the main host, Buzzy. There's also a, um, uh, in my book, Buzzy, you were uh, tied with Ken to host. David Faber, second. Faber had a good outing. I was surprised how good Faber was, actually. I think a lot of people were surprised by a lot of people. You know, I think a lot of folks who had favorites were kind of disappointed. I think, I don't know totally, I don't know how much, how people, different people approached it, you know. Um, but I, I think a lot of people were pleasantly surprised. Even like there were some people who were like, I can't believe I'm enjoying Joe Buck. Um, I don't know. Right, which, right, I don't know right. The American public <laughs> that made him so. I'm not a big sports guy, but uh, yeah, for some reason he is he's re both reviled and celebrated by the public. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's what you want. Yeah. Hey, the the um the uh, new podcast is this is Jeopardy. Uh, the tournament of champions. There's the prime time event coming, right? I mean, just uh, uh, the Masters, Jeopardy okay, Masters. Masters, which is uh, I think airing in a, like a week and a half. It's right, not the coming week, but the following week. It's, I saw the first couple of shows get taped. It's gonna, it's incredible. And so that, the masters are what? These are people. They're who... the, the six top current players. So that's uh, Amy Schneider, Matt Amodio, Matea Roach, Andrew He, and Sam Buttry, who were two finalists in the Tournament of Champions, and James Holtower. So wow. that is really the cream of the crop. And um, Jeopardy is creating something like a pyramid, right? Like in football, where they're creating the, all these different tournaments to. You ladder you up into masters and get relegated down into the other tournaments. <laughs> so it's like a whole thing. There's a postseason. There's like you I know, love it. So it's really fun. There's a lot going it, on. It's I an industry. It. I love it. Uh, again, check out the podcast. You will love it. It is a great ride with Buzzy Cohen. This is Jeopardy, is what it's called. Uh, Buzzy, love you. Thank you for stopping love through. Can't wait Thanks. to uh, listen to the next episode. Okay, my friend. Bye. See you, man. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.